Welcome everybody. Um, just a couple of, oh, I'm getting a very wicked echo. Hopefully you all can hear me. Um, so a couple uh, sort of housekeeping things before we get going tonight. This is the um, ninth meeting of the pandemic advisory team this year here at Great River. And I'm gonna speak a little bit to what that means, um, but I'm also recording tonight's session because unlike the eight previous meetings, and I'll keep stopping myself as I, as I let people join the meeting because I am managing the meeting and talking at the same time. Um, unlike the eight previous meetings, at this meeting we are specifically um, inviting the community to join us um, and inviting everybody who would like to come and just ask questions of the committee, um, of the team, or ask questions of me. Um, and so our agenda tonight um, is to speak a little bit about the committee, um, for me to speak for a little bit about the work that we've done so far this year uh, in the preceding eight meeting. Um, and then also um, to speak to some recent updates around COVID at, uh, around COVID at Great River. Um, and so I'm just, people are just joining now. So keep having to click on the button. All right. Welcome everybody, if you're just joining now. Um, speak to, uh, I'll be speaking a little bit to COVID updates, definitely. Um, and then also um, I'd like to take sort of uh, a Q and A um, of everybody who comes tonight who has some questions for the committee in general, um, for the team in general. Um, I could have set tonight up as a, um, uh, like a webinar setting, um, but it got very tricky because there are so many members, running members of the uh, pandemic advisory team that instead I decided to run it as a, as a regular uh, COVID meeting. Um, and uh, just to invite people to join, which means I'm gonna be speaking here shortly to also how I will invite questions. Um, how I'm going to um, have people um, share their questions and potentially have people who are on the team um, share um, potential answers to the questions as well. So um, we'll get into all of that in just a little bit. Um, and then I also am going to um, sort of collect in our, note, in our running notes document for the team, I'm going to be collecting um, sort of parking lot kind of questions and parking lot issues, things that we may not have time to get to in an hour tonight, but that we would like to uh, potentially circle back to or spend some time on as a committee. So um, that's sort of the agenda for this evening. Um, I'm hoping to adjourn at uh, right about seven o'clock. If anybody needs to leave at any time, that's totally fine, of course. Um, but if you do have uh, any running questions, what I'm gonna ask is that people drop their questions into the chat um, in order to manage uh, the fact that we have now 30 participants tonight. Um, so I'm gonna sort of manage the questions through the chat specifically. So if you have a question, um, as we're going, you can drop it in. I might not get to it until we get to the Q&A section. Um, but if it, if it can't get to your question before you wind up leaving tonight, I will also try to reach out to you um, to answer your question as well if you're not able to stay the entire evening. So, um, all right, we still have people joining here. So let's give it just a second. All right, I think that's everybody in the waiting room now. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, the pandemic advisory team, uh, just to give you all a little history real quick, uh, the pandemic advisory team ar arose out of a number of teams that existed last year that Sam had put, into get, had put together along with other staff members at Great River. Um, and those teams were dedicated to specific aspects of the pandemic. Then as we got further along in the pandemic, um, it made sense to me this year to have sort of one main managing team related to pandemic, uh, at, at pandemic advisory. So the purpose of this team is that uh, the team works together to collect input, to collect research, and to advise the Great, Liver, Great, Liver, Great River leadership team and the school board 
in decisions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So just so everybody knows, to be clear, it's not a decision-making group so much as an advisory group. It's a group that collects information and, and makes recommendations to the school specifically. So um, also just because some of you joined a little bit later, um, I'm gonna let you know that I am recording tonight's event, um, tonight's meeting, because we have so many people joining tonight, 33 participants. Um, I'm hoping to be able to post tonight's meeting as well so that um, anyone who isn't able to join tonight's meeting but wanted to get the information would have access to it. So um, hopefully everybody is comfortable with that. Um, uh, I spoke a little bit to the purpose. Uh, I mentioned that this is our ninth meeting of the year. So um, I also have a dual purpose tonight in that anybody who comes tonight who is just an observer tonight, but who is interested potentially in joining the committee, um, you would be more than welcome to join our committee. Um, it looks like, I think there are, I wanna say off the top of my head real quickly, about eight or nine members of the standing committee who are here um, at least, and then also a number of other um, visitors tonight. Um, so, if you're interested in joining the committee regularly, we meet um, probably every two to three weeks. However, you do not have to commit to meeting every two to three weeks in order to join the committee. Um, you could choose to join and come monthly. You could choose to join and do a particular project for the school or for the committee. Um, it's not a commitment that uh, is uh, definite that you have to be here every single time, but we do meet uh, every two or three weeks. Um, and uh, like I was saying earlier, it's, it's about advising the school and we're trying to get as, as diverse a set of voices and opinions and views on the committee as possible. So we have some staff members on the committee we have some parents on the committee, we have a community member on the committee, we have um, members of the committee who are medical professionals and who work uh, in public health and who work for the Department of Health. Um, but we also have members of the committee who are concerned parents who just want to participate in the process, um, which is wonderful. And those voices are just as important to me to hear all of those voices, so. Um, so that's my pitch for this evening, if you're interested in joining and you're not a member of the committee. Um, I'm going to speak real quickly here. I, I was going to potentially have some introductions. Um, I told myself if we had less than about 20 people here tonight, we would do introductions. Um, but we're up to 34 people now at this point. Um, and I do want to be respectful of people's time. There's quite a few people in the group tonight. Um, and so um, we'll probably just skip introductions um, and uh, so that we have time for those Q&A. So we have time for as many questions as possible. Um, but I would like to say for those of you who are standing members of the committee during the Q&A, and I'll speak more to that later. Uh, like I said, I'd love people to drop their questions in the chat. Um, during the Q&A, if you're a standing member of the committee and you would like to assist in the answering of the question, um, that is absolutely perfect. Um, feel free to either raise your hand uh, with the raise hand function or else to um, just unmute and, and jump in if you're a member of the committee who has some information that I am forgetting or something along those lines to a, a particular question. All right. Um, I wanted to speak real quickly before we get into questions and answers at all tonight about uh, the work that this committee has done this year. Um, and it's been quite a bit of different things that the committee has advised on and worked towards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so if, uh, if I'm missing anything, I apologize uh, to those committee members who maybe worked on anything that I missed. Um, but as I went through the old agendas, um, I saw that we started this year by talking about the safe return to school plan. You may have seen that on the school website. Uh, the Safe Return to School Plan was authored um, in large part by me, um, taking information from previous plans and from the Department of Health, but also this committee played a huge role, not just in uh, advising me on questions that came up in the Safe Return to School Plan, but also specifically on um, 
really authoring it, really coming up with a lot of the different uh, uh, specifics of the plan as we got into what does quarantining look like? What does, um, how are, what mitigation strategies are we going to be using in the building and when and how often and in what situations? So um, the Safe Return to School plan is available on the school website. Um, it's been up uh, for quite a while and it does get adjusted periodically every now and then because of the changing nature of the pandemic we wind up, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. We wind up uh, adjusting things that are in the safe return to school plan. So um, do keep an eye on that. And, um, and I do try to also update the community in the school newsletter if there are specific updates also to the plan. Um, another thing that this committee worked on uh, very uh, 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 heavily for uh, several weeks was um, what are called the Corsi Rosenthal boxes. Um, and thanks to a number of committee members um, who both worked on those, but actually who suggested them to the school in the first place. If you're not familiar with them, they're um, uh, homemade do-it-yourself air filter boxes that we use at Great River specifically in the classrooms um, and have been using since the beginning of the school year. Um, to help filter the air through, um, uh, it's basically like a set of air filters with a fan on top um, that pulls air through the filters um, and can recirculate the air in the classroom uh, uh, more frequently than either our HVAC system circulates the air or uh, than the store-bought filters, uh, smaller store-bought filters that we had in the classroom. So those filters were a suggestion of this committee. And then also um, actually members of this committee are the ones who organize the building sessions, um, who put up front for the costs of the filters um, and uh, who basically got the whole thing up and running and got them into our classrooms for this first part of the school year. Uh, another thing that this committee was very specifically tied to so far this year was the board policy that requires staff to vaccinate. So this is um, a board policy that is, uh, it was based in many ways upon the St. Paul School Board Resolution. Um, many school districts in the Twin Cities uh, and uh, in the states and in the country have now decided to make a similar mandate. Um, we had several school districts like St. Paul and, and Minneapolis who were faster at it than we were. Um, but we did, uh, with the help of this committee and some advi advice from this committee, uh, we were able to get a board policy in place. We worked with the school union um, and created a board policy that everybody was uh, uh, together on um, in order to have, in order to encourage and uh, have uh, staff members in the building specifically vaccinate. Sorry if I keep stumbling, I'm, I'm in letting people into the meeting as they show up and it is uh, always distracting to um, try to do that and talk at the same time, so I apologize. Um, another thing that this committee worked on uh, so far this year is the uh, safety plan, the COVID safety plan related to the Harvest Fest. Um, there was a member of this committee in particular who participates both in PEG and in this committee, which is wonderful to have. And we're trying to get more committees, more committee members to be on both committees specifically, um, who did a ton of work uh, with the advice of this committee uh, to put together the safety plan that was used during Harvest Fest, uh, the COVID safety plan specifically. Um, another thing that this committee had advised the school to do and that we put some effort into creating was the uh, COVID dashboard that um, was something that was done by the school last year and we hadn't started the year with it. I wasn't really aware of it. It wasn't kind of on my radar. Um, but then we started including it in the newsletter at the recommendations of this committee. And then recently I started including it in all of my community-wide update emails related to COVID um, so that the entire community could get a sense of how many cases we're talking about, how many negative tests we're talking about during that month and during the year so far. So if you've seen that at the bottom of my community emails recently, that was a recommendation that came from this committee specifically. Um, and another thing that this committee has worked on uh, a fair amount certainly has been testing in the building, having testing available in the building. Now we did start up COVID testing for staff, 
We had one round of COVID testing so far for staff and we hit a number of speed bumps along the way. I can speak to that a little bit during the update section, uh, but we, uh, we hit a couple speed bumps along the way. And so we are continuing to develop and work and figure out how to be offering that testing first to staff and then hopefully eventually to students as well. So um, is there anybody on the committee who would love to raise their hand and be like, oh, David, we also worked on this other thing. I think that was pretty comprehensive, but I might've missed something. If anybody thinks of anything, feel free to either drop it in the chat or to raise their hand and I can uh, have you unmute and, and add to the conversation. Um, so um, I also wanted to give some recent updates before we get into q and I figure between all of the review of the work we've done this year and the recent updates that I wanna speak to, um, it will definitely fuel tonight's question and answer session because I'm feeling like there'll be a number of questions that come out of the things that I'm saying right now. Um, as far as recent updates, um, I do want to speak to the number of cases we've had recently. Um, we are in a situation, as um, many of you are probably aware, where the case rates in Minnesota are, um, I heard basically some of the worst, if not, some, if not the worst case rates um, in the, in the, in the um, United States right now. Um, we've got uh, uh, very high numbers and we have, um, we're not seeing much of a drop off, which people have been talking about for weeks in terms of case rates in Minnesota. Um, we might see a drop off, but I'm a little personally um, not so sure about what the next couple of weeks will, will look like with the holiday season coming up um, and even this fall break coming up this next week with uh, how much families are gathering and people are gathering. Um, so a little cautious uh, about that myself. Um, and any predictions that say cases are going to be going down in Minnesota in the coming weeks. Um, but what that does mean is that we have seen a, a number of cases uh, at Great River. And so we are up to, um, at this point, the entire school year, we're up to 19 cases that we've had at Great River that we've recorded. Um, and uh, the, some of those are staff members, the majority of those are students um, at this point. Um, also, the one thing that I, I was proud of that I felt like we could say for a long time is that we had no, uh, that we were not sure anyway, it's always hard to tell where cases, of course, are coming from um, exactly, um, but it seemed to us based on the data and the contact tracing that we weren't having very much community spread at, at Great River. Uh, so community spread within the building, specifically within the school building, we weren't having very much for weeks and weeks, we seemed to be having isolated cases um, that would come out of um, uh, that would be coming out of the community at large, it seemed like, again, hard to know for sure, especially if there was someone in the building who was asymptomatic and never tested or something like that. It's, it's certainly possible there were cases of in building community spread. Um, but we had one case so far of a staff member who seemingly uh, did, contra did contract COVID in the building, it seems like. And then just in the last few weeks, we've had three cases that I believe are likely community spread within the building, which is a big shift for us. Um, it's a recent change just in the last two weeks. We had two cases that were, uh, we believe, spread um, in a situation on a bus where we had one student on a bus who tested positive. And then about five days later, we had two students who were sitting basically next to that student on the bus test positive. So we are guessing, but uh, assuming that spread happened on that bus in, um, on that particular day. Um, and then just now we've had uh, a case that we found about this morning of a student who it seems like uh, potentially um, was con did contract COVID in the classroom, which is our first case of community spread in the classroom that we've had so far this year. So concerning um, and also reminder to us that we need to continue our mitigation strategies, that we need to continue to mask, that case rates are very high in Minnesota right now, that we need to continue to do the things that we're doing um, we have had a series of situations where we quarantined a classroom, 
Um, and first it was a teacher and now it is those three students where we quarantined a classroom or a portion of a school bus and then someone else did get COVID. So that tells us to a certain degree that our quarantining practices are potentially slowing or stopping the spread pretty significantly. Because if those three students and that staff member had tested positive and were around other students at the time, we'd likely see a great, a great many more cases um, at, at Great River. Um, other aspects of recent updates, I, um, I wanted to share a quick story with you all before we get into the Q&A. Um, and it's not meant to be a scary story, it's meant to be for us a, a sort of success story um, that I think we've been working really hard um, with our quarantining practices. I think it's been very difficult on families, and I know that. Um, I know that we have quarantined a lot of students in elementary in particular, and that's a, a huge challenge to families. Um, and also I was speaking with uh, every, almost every week, it didn't happen this week, but almost every week I get on a phone call with uh, school leaders of charter schools around the state. There's usually between 60 and 80 or so school leaders from around the state who come together on Tuesday mornings to have a conversation. And so um, I, uh, I raised my hand and, and, and took the floor for a moment and asked everybody, what are you all doing? I wanna know what you as a group of charter schools around the state are doing in terms of um, quarantining. Because we're quarantining, we've suddenly been quarantining a number of classes. We have a number of students who are coming and going from the building. Um, it seems to be a way that we have stopped quite a bit of community spread, but I'd really love to know what other schools are doing. Um, a number of schools basically describe similar quarantining practices to us. But then a number of schools, especially, uh, it seemed like honestly outside the, the Twin Cities area, um, described the fact that they weren't doing a tremendous amount of quarantining. One school in particular said they had been quarantining the same way we were quarantining and then um, decided not to. And the school board made a decision to stop quarantining. And he, as a, as a cautionary tale, um, that week, it was last Tuesday that I spoke to him. He said, um, we're in the process of shoving down the whole school this week because we've had a hundred student cases in the last seven days. So again, not meant to be a scary story, um, but a story of, for us here at Great River, a story that shows that the work that we're doing um, really is helpful work, I believe. I personally believe that we've been making choices that really are keeping kids safer. So um, that is the gist of my presentation for tonight. Um, but I do want to open up uh, the Q&A, like I said, in order to manage uh, the question and answer session tonight. Um, what I would love for people to do would be to drop their questions in the chat. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, Zoom, along the bar on the bottom of the screen, there's a button that says chat. And if you click on that, it should bring up the chat on the right, right hand bar of your screen. Um, you can in the bottom type messages and choose who you message. You can message an individual person or everyone in the meeting. I ask that you leave it to everyone in the meeting and um, type in any question that you might have. I'll give you all a minute just to, just to type. All right, first question. So um, for those of you just joining, I just had two more people join the room. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, I just spoke for 25 minutes, um, but uh, we are getting into the uh, Q&A section of the evening. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those questions right into the chat and I will do my best to answer them or uh, get the support of the, uh, of the pandemic advisory team in answering those questions as well. So um, uh, first question, when are you going to have take home testing kits available for students to take home when they have symptoms at school? Excellent question. So that had actually been one of the first things that I had hoped to do with the um, testing practices at the school. I had been hoping to send home testing kits specifically from Vault. Um, and then there are there have been, 
I think five different companies that the state has advised that we work with for testing in the building. Um, and I made a, a appointment with Vault earlier in the year, and I sat down with a representative from Vault. From Vault, and um, Vault was adamant that representative that even though we are a public school, there was a eighty-six dollar charge per test. Now. We do have uh, a pretty significant grant from the state. Um, and so the argument that the vault people were making was that we should be using our grant money to pay for the vault testing to send home kits with families. Um, but we had already sort of decided that we were going to use, and I think for good reason, we were going to use our grant money um, on staffing in order to manage the tests in the building. And the other four testing companies um, have told us that their testing is free, that there is no cost to the school. Now, since then, our school robotics team reached out to Vault and was able to get free tests from Vault. Um, and so I am not sure how exactly Michael Flood managed that, um, but it does seem like there has potentially been some change in the practices of the company um, or that particular salesperson was misinformed because we are a public school and he was confused or I'm not sure what. So my plan right now is to reach, I think they're, they're the easiest of the take home options, um, but you do need to have, um, there's like a login you need to make, you need to take the test in front of somebody. Um, and so, um, but the easiest in terms of us managing it for the school. So I am planning on reaching back out to Vault um, and seeing if we could have symptomatic tests that we send home with students um, specifically so they could do at home testing, um, especially since the robotics team has been using the Vault test for the last week uh, to sort of pilot it for other after school activities. Um, there are other testing options, um, and I could speak quite a bit to those. We've um, had uh, we've been trying to use the testing option from both Battelle and from Binax now, and we also uh, started researching the Q tests, which was another option. All of these testing options turn out to be extraordinarily frustrating in terms of the amount of bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through to get them going and started. You need to get a uh, certain, you need to get a, a CLIA certificates, and then you need to get a doctor to sign off on each test, and then you need to get um, uh, all the information from each of the people, including their vaccination dates put into the system um, in a spreadsheet. And then you need to get, and it's just been like one thing after another with each of the different testing companies that has made it very challenging. Um, and then very unfortunately, this is very new information as of today, um, we, we were able to hire um, a testing coordinator for the building with our grant money. And I was extraordinarily excited about our testing coordinator. She had both experience in education, 12 years working in education, and she had um, like 18 years or something working in a laboratory um, collecting medical samples. So you couldn't look for somebody whose resume was sort of more perfect for a COVID testing coordinator than somebody who has both experience collecting medical samples and also who's worked in education and is very comfortable around kids. So very excited about hiring that person, unfortunately, not because of the job itself, but because of some family commitments and some family issues. Uh, she sat, came to talk to me today um, and has resigned her position. So we are again tomorrow, posting our COVID testing coordinator position again, hoping to find another candidate. And if anyone out here tonight is either interested or knows someone who might be interested, um, that position will be posted tomorrow morning um, on the school's website and on a couple, uh, several state posting boards, uh, job posting boards. So if somebody's interested in stepping in, um, I'd be more than interested in talking to anybody about that. I was so excited about Anna and her resume and, and the work she was doing over the last three weeks was phenomenal. And it's just not going to work out um, because of some family issues, like I said. Um, so um, I'll move on to the next questions though. There are a number more. So um, as elementary students are now eligible for COVID vaccinations, how will quarantining practices change to reflect that? For example, 
If there is a positive case, will Great River only quarantine students who are still unvaccinated? So that is the plan right now. The way we do it in adolescence, if you do not have a student in the adolescent program, is that we only quarantine the unvaccinated students. And then we opt, we allow parents to choose to quarantine their student if they are vaccinated and there has been a case. So we still inform the community. There's been a case in your classroom or uh, your student is potentially a close contact for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, if your student is vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine, but you can choose to. That's how we've been doing it in adolescent for the whole school year, pretty much. Um, the plan is to move into a plan that looks much more like that in elementary. However, I have been having some conversations with the school's lawyer about collecting information um, if you don't know, there is in the state law, there is a law that allows us to collect information on vaccine on certain specific vaccinations like the MMR, for instance, um, and that COVID vaccination is not listed amongst those. Um, so our lawyer is putting together um, basically like a form we would have families fill out if they choose to inform the school that their child is vaccinated or not. And then we could track from there, but we can't require it. And in offering that form, it has to include what's called a Tennyson warning, which is a privacy notice basically. So there's some specific things we have to do to get to the point where we um, are collecting information as to whether or not families or uh, students are vaccinated. Um, and um, what we have been doing in the adolescence is much more, because it is so challenging, um, is much more of sort of an honor system. And it's not ideal in some ways, but um, it has been more manageable for us in other ways. Um, so the goal is to move, not that we don't trust people, but the goal is to move away from more of an honor system and more into an actual tracking of vaccinations kind of system. Um, I'm gonna keep moving on here. Um, have you considered requiring a negative test for students to return from Thanksgiving break? Perhaps a day or two off in distance learning next week to allow time to get tested. Um, it's an excellent question. We did, um, uh, uh, I did throw out to the other school leaders actually also around the state if they, if anybody was asking after uh, holiday breaks, um, if they were at, if they were going to distance learning or if they were requiring testing. What we have been doing um, at Great River is we've been encouraging anybody, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, send an email out about this to remind people, but we've been encouraging anybody who's doing um, travel, especially an air, uh, uh, airline travel, um, or who maybe is going into a situation where they're seeing family members that they're not usually around to get tested, um, but we haven't been requiring distance learning specifically. Um, I'd be happy to talk more with the leadership team about it. Um, I think the feeling was that um, because we are moving more into a point where more and more students are vaccinated, especially by the time we would come back from uh, the winter break in January, where hopefully a great number of students will be vaccinated. The hope was um, that that might not be necessary, but I am open to talking more about the leadership, talking more to the leadership team about that. Um, can you address new lunch practices? We've now moved indoors. Um, how will we track fully success? How will we track the success spread of this? Can families be officially notified of this change? Um, yes. So um, I I tried to write about it in the last newsletter, but I don't think I was specific enough because I've gotten this question a number of times, and so that is on me. I do apologize if I haven't been specific enough about it. Um, we've gotten to a point, and I've actually had some very mixed, it's been a very polarizing issue, um, eating indoors, eating outdoors. I've had a number of families reach out to me um, when the temperature was even down into the 40s, saying that it was too cold for kids to be eating outdoors, sitting still for so long. I had other families tell me that kids should be eating outdoors uh, until it was down to about 15, 20, 15 degrees, uh, something around those lines. Um, and so um, where we landed was that um, if the temperature dropped into the 30s, um, and it was a bit of a negotiation, but um, if the temperature dropped into the 30s, that we would start eating indoors, but use our indoor eating mitigation strategies, including silent lunches, um, including spreading the kids out to 
you know, take off your mask, eat, put your mask back on right away before you engage in any sort of activities. Um, not talking to other students, but listening to a podcast or listening to a reading that the teacher was making. Things along those lines to try to mitigate um, the spread of COVID, um, even in cold temperatures, um, where eating outdoors is such a challenge. I do want to share that I have actually had a couple families that have decided, um, two in particular, that have decided that they would rather come and, and pick their families, pick their students up for lunch, um, which is a huge challenge to families. I get that. And many families would not be able to do that. But what I reached out just last Friday to those two families and suggested is um, because we are we would have such difficulty staffing an outdoor lunch, would it be possible? Would you be interested if you're coming to school anyway and potentially you know, basically volunteer staffing an outdoor lunch for families that are interested in it specifically continuing um, and having parent chaperones uh, specifically staff that? You know, We have a hard time staffing two lunches because my worry uh, continues to be that if there are students eating outdoors, um, even in some of the classrooms, it's easier than others, but in some classrooms, it's just impossible in elementary. If we have students who are eating outdoors basically unsupervised, um, that worries me to have students, especially the younger elementary students outdoors unsupervised. Um, and so, but the way our schedule is set up is that the classroom assistant and the teacher are either at recess or, or either at their own lunch or at their students' lunch or at recess on a rotating schedule so that there are fewer people with the kids during lunch, usually just one with the kids during lunch anyway. So it got to be a real staffing issue to have an outdoor lunch and an indoor lunch happening simultaneously. Um, but for those parents who are interested in potentially participating, you can feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in, in potentially volunteering to help chaperone an outdoor lunch um, in the coming weeks. I don't know at what point we would say, no, we just, it's just, way too cold to have kids sit still for that long. Maybe we would say, you know, the suggested 20 degree temperature cutoff or something along those lines. We haven't discussed that option. Um, but if we can get enough parents to talk about it um, and potentially support with it, it might be something we could make happen. Um, the next question was oh, uh, the temperature threshold. That's what I just spoke about. Um, so um, it shouldn't be that they were eating indoors on a 40 degree day. So um, if it's 40 degrees or above, students should be eating outdoors uh, across the board. And if that hasn't happened, please feel free to send me an email and I'd be happy to talk to that teacher. What we tried to do was we tried to set a specific time and a specific app that we're using because there is inconsistency between different weather apps at times as to what the temperature exactly is. Um, and so at, um, I'd have to ask Jean exactly what it is, but at like 11 o'clock on this specific app, everybody looks at it. And if the temperature is uh, in the 30s, that's when we eat indoors. So there is like a, a practice that's been set very specifically around it. Um, has it been discussed to vaccinate at school? Yes. Um, so that is an option. The state put it out as uh, basically put out a survey to school leaders and said, who is interested in hosting a vaccination clinic at their schools? Um, and I immediately responded yes and filled out the form saying that we were interested. However, my understanding um, from some contacts um, that are actually on this committee is that there was just a flood of schools that said we want a vaccination clinic at our school, like so many more than the state was necessarily um, thinking would happen, that they wound up prioritizing by a number of different ways. And I can't speak to exactly how they prioritized, but I heard, for example, that they were prioritizing um, some schools based on size, based on location to spread out where the locations were that schools were offering vaccines, and also possibly on free and reduced lunch rates to make it easier for schools that had very high free and reduced lunch rates, um, to make it easier on those families that might otherwise have challenges getting their kids to vaccination sites. So um, with that being said, we still haven't heard back from the state um, on whether, whether or not or when we might be able to offer a vaccination site at Great River. Um, but we did reach out to them again. Dan emailed them again 
I want to say it was on Friday, um, just to say, what's the status of this? Can you update us on, on if this is going to happen or not? So we would really like it to happen. Um, what is the quarantining practice for students who are fully vaccinated? So um, as I spoke to just a little while ago, um, and I'll try not to repeat myself too much in the past, what we've done for adolescent students who are fully vaccinated is that they can opt to quarantine if their families find out that they were a close contact and they want to quarantine their students, they can, um, but that they don't need to. And that's based on the uh, Minnesota Department of Health decision-making tree um, that we use to, to, to make these calls. There's also a really handy new visual that was put out by the CDC that a member of this committee shared with me just a few days ago, I think, that I think we're going to go ahead and use on our website because it's, um, it's a really very, very clear visual on basically determining if you're a close contact and determining whether or not you should quarantine. And it follows exactly what we've been doing, but in a clearer way than uh, I think the MDH decision-making tree outlines it. So we will be putting that visual out soon to help, help clarify this for everyone. Um, no questions from our family, just thanks for the updates and the information session. Of course, you're more than welcome. I'm glad so many people were able to join tonight. And the COVID committees work and GRS following the best practice COVID pr protocols. Thank you, we've been doing our best. There's, there's always gray area. That's what we've discovered in the COVID protocols, right? Like we um, do our best to follow them as closely as we can and then questions come up. Um, what happens um, when it's, you know, when a staff member finds out their partner tests is positive for COVID, but they're vaccinated and they've been wearing a mask around each other or whatever the situation is, like how does that fit into the decision-making tree can be a real challenge. And so there's also a lot of like sort of um, using our best, uh, using our, our, our um, common sense um, to make our best decisions that we possibly can based on the based on what we've been told. So um, what is the barometer for offering distance learning options and supports in the cases of potential community spread continue to rise? That's a really excellent question. Um, so it's hard for me to say an exact number or percentage. Um, what I was told at one point in, an, in a meeting um, of some school nurses was that if there were five cases of community spread in a week, that the state would consider it an outbreak at a school. Um, that always seemed weird to me because schools are such different sizes that five cases at a school of 120 versus five cases at a school of 1,200 seems like a very different situation to me. Um, so I haven't gotten super clear guidance on when the state would come in and say, no, you guys have got to shut down for two weeks. Um, but other schools have definitely done it across the state. And so what I do look out for is those cases of community spread very specifically. Um, there's always sort of mitigating circumstances and there's always, you know, the number of cases in the state. At what point will the state come out and recommend um, it's possible if the cases continue to go up that the state might come out and recommend we just move to distance learning. So we've been doing a lot of prep work to get ready for that possible move to pivot suddenly and be ready for distance learning if we have to do that as a school or as a program, say it's elementary students or, um, or you know, elementary and middle students or something along those lines. Um, but we don't have, we just, we basically keep having that same conversation. Every time there's a case of community spread, there's a conversation of is now the time in which we're we're considering um, in which we're considering closing the school for a couple of weeks to just get everybody back um, uh, on the same page in terms of quarantine. Um, I'm hoping not to have to do it. I really am. And at the same time, that number five sort of sticks in my head, and it's totally arbitrary. <laughs> so um, you know, we 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 try to think about it every time a, a community case a, commu a spread of community a case of community spread comes up. Um, can you address staff accountability procedures for safety practices at school, masking at all times, proper use of air filtration? Absolutely. So um, there is, um, and I think I have an outstanding email maybe from you, Jonathan, on this, and I'm sorry that I haven't gotten back to you yet. And anyone else in the room who I have an outstanding email from, I, I just throw out the standing apology that I have been 
absolutely flooded with emails. So doing my best to get back to them as quickly as I can. Um, but I did read that email, John. I think it was from you, Jonathan. Um, and so um, a couple things about that. So um, we did have a situation where we, whenever we become aware of a situation having to do with a staff member who isn't following mitigation protocols, we act on it very quickly. So when we became aware, for instance, of a staff member who seemed to not be wearing their mask um, as consistently as they should or as well as they should, we immediately pulled that staff member aside and had a conversation with them. Um, sometimes there are staff members who, you know, are sitting down to lunch in a private office who close the door and eat inside, um, things along those lines. Um, but that's not always what we're talking about. Sometimes we're talking about somebody who was eating lunch, but, you know, stands up to answer the door and talks to a student without a mask on or something that we just can't have that happen. Um, and so we try to really act on those things very quickly if we hear about any of those things. If I see a staff member, it's very rare among staff members. It happens among students, but uh, very rare among staff members. But if I see a staff member who's not wearing their mask properly or potentially who's not wearing a, you know, an, a good mask, um, I do have those conversations um, with staff members when I become aware of it. Um, the uh, air filtration question, um, I do, I am aware, I'm not on Facebook myself, but I became aware recently that there was a question on Facebook specifically around um, one of the air filtration units, one of the Corsi Rosenthal boxes that wasn't being used. And I don't mean to make excuses at all. I spoke to the pandemic advisory team about this a few weeks ago. Um, it had kind of been shoved in a corner and I honestly, I think I had walked past it 10 times without noticing that it was in the corner because some things were in front of it. And, um, but I, I own that. I own that I walked past it without noticing that it wasn't being used. I think the instructor in that classroom was running a store-bought air filtration unit. And my understanding is that that guide was under the impression that the, those air units, those, the, the Corsi Rosenthal boxes were for rooms that didn't already have an air filter running. They didn't understand that the idea is that we wanted both air filters running. Um, and that also could be on me for not communicating clearly enough, possibly. Um, but literally, once we saw that post, um, Gene went that morning um, and picked up that box and carried it into the room and plugged it in and turned it on and explained to the teacher that, no, we need you to have both filters running at all times. Um, so we are, we, are, we are trying to be as on top of those things as, as absolutely um, quickly as we possibly can. So um, not a question, but some follow-up inf info. Elementary was told that lunches are now entirely inside and the tables are now removed. Tomorrow will be in the 40s, I think, but I doubt any classes will eat outside since there's no longer tables or spaces with the communication to staff. We wound up having to take um, uh, with, we wound up having to take the tents down because of the wind. We were having them getting damaged um, in the wind and there was uh, quite a bit of wind this last weekend. Um, the tables, you're correct, were stacked and I, I actually talked to Todd about this today because my understanding is we were not stacking tables yet. But it doesn't mean we can't eat outdoors. It just means we don't necessarily have the tables to eat on. So we have to go back to eating on the grass berm on the side of the parking lot like we were doing at the beginning of the school year. So it was a unfortunate error that the tables got stacked a few weeks before I was expecting that to happen. We do have to stack the tables at some point because we're going to have to have um, the uh, parking lots plowed. Um, and so with the plowing procedures coming through, it's gonna be really hard just to leave the tables all spread out. Um, but um, but that, was, that was in error. We weren't expecting to move the tables quite so quickly. So it is still possible for us to um, eat outdoors. Um, and I'm listening to uh, it is still possible for us to eat outdoors. We just have to um, be a little more creative about it if the temperature's in the 40s, um, certainly. Um, would a pivot to distance learning take student vaccination status into account? That's an excellent question. Um, it could, potentially. We hadn't, I haven't actually discussed that with anyone. Um, 
Thank you, Kat, for that question. Nobody has asked me that yet. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to the pandemic advisory team and to the leadership team at our, my meeting tomorrow about that question. Would we potentially advise unvaccinated students to go to distance learning and vaccinated students to remain in uh, in-person learning? Um, possibly. I'm sorry that I hadn't considered it till now. Um, does part of the uh, prep for potential school closure include plans for families with essential workers unable to work from home as it did last year? Um, so it kind of depends. That's a great question. It kind of depends on the nature of the shift. If we shift to distance learning for a week to quarantine the entire school, um, it would be very difficult for us to put a uh, full full blown childcare, for lack of a better phrase, into place and get it staffed and get it all set up. Um, but we have talked about what it means to put that in place should the school move back into distance learning for a longer period of time. So if it's for a quarantine kind of stretch period of time, it's unlikely we'd be able to get that in place quickly enough. Um, but we would, um, uh, but we would, if we did a longer shift, I think have to talk about, put, I, I, I'm blanking on what it was called last year. There was a name for the program that it wasn't called the child care. There was a name for the program that was in school during the school day um, at Great River. But to put that program back in place um, is, is possible. It just would take quite a bit of work and getting it in place over the course of a week or two and then coming straight back into uh, in-person learning. Um, doesn't quite make sense um, for us in terms of our ability and our and our capacity. So um, nice spirit wear. Oh yes, I have my spirit wear on tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, so um, has there been discussion about when masking might be dropped, uh, like a date? I guess since you cannot ask about vaccination status. Um, so um, I wish I knew in terms of a date. Um, I think. Um, it is quite possible that we will consider uh, uh, dropping a masking mandate at some point. Um, what it would probably look like is that case rates would have to be quite low um, in the county and in the state. In the county is specifically what I keep my eye on. Um, and if you look at the guidance from last year, there was like different color bands and they basically were recommending masks all the way down to the lowest color band um, of the of the different categories. And we are um, not just in the highest color band right now in the state of Minnesota, but actually they had to like extend the graphic to sh to go as high as we are right now in Minnesota from where the, what the graphic on the website I was using looked like previously um, on the Mayo Clinic. They had to like change the 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 way the graph looked to include um, high enough numbers for where we're at right now. So um, hard for me to say a date, um, but is it possible? It's certainly possible. I'd love to get to that point. I do think we are at a stage right now where we're getting to the point where uh, the COVID pandemic is honestly shifting to become an endemic. And that's a sad thing to have to say. We're not at a point, and I think the medical, I hope the medical professionals, I'm not a medical professional, just to be clear, but I hope those who are in the room would agree with me, um, that we're not going to drive uh, COVID-19 out of the population entirely anytime soon. It's going to uh, more likely be uh, an endemic situation, more like what the flu is, where it comes around each year and we get a shot for it, hopefully, for those of us who um, are able to get COVID vaccinations. Um, we get shots for it and we continue to um, occasionally get COVID-19 and hopefully not very seriously because of the uh, improvements to the vaccines and, and all those sorts of things. We're not there yet. I think we're still at a point where we're, you know, obviously the very youngest among us aren't even able to vaccine at this point. Um, and so we're still at a point where those vaccines are under development. And I think we're still at a point where we're in a pandemic kind of situation. Um, but that won't always be true. And I don't think we're going to be wearing masks in schools forever. Um, at least I hope not. They're not the most comfortable things in the world. They're, they're worth it, but they're not the most comfortable things. Um, how are we gathering the feelings and thoughts of the whole GRS community on these issues? Um, 
That's a good question. Um, we were just talking the other day um, about, um, oh, thank you, Student Resource Center. <laughs> Thank you, Cassie, for reminding me what it was called. It wasn't called child care. It was called the Student Resource Center last year. Um, uh, how are we gathering the feelings and thoughts of the entire community? Um, excellent question. So we were just talking the other day about how we haven't done um, a community-wide survey in quite a while. Um, we do have opportunities for feedback on the website. We do have the pandemic advisory team, which tries to collect a variety of voices in which everyone here tonight is certainly more than welcome to join. Um, but it's not quite the same thing as how it was run last year um, with our um, question set question and answer sessions like this that happened on a much more regular basis and surveys that were going out on a more regular basis. So it's come to my it's it's sort of of I am of the opinion that it is time for another survey. <laughs> um, and we've been so tied up with all the quarantines and all the changes in vaccination status and, and all of that, that we just haven't had a chance to put it together yet. But it is on the list um, very specifically for the leadership team to discuss tomorrow, I believe, if I remember the agenda correct. But I'm going to make a note of it anyway. case it got pushed off to a later agenda, we should talk about it right away. So um, I think I've come to the end of the questions and it is 657, um, which is pretty fantastic. Um, does anybody um, does anybody have any other questions or does anybody have any um, anything from the committee that they would like to add specifically? I'm getting a couple direct messages, just people um, offering some support with a couple different things, which is great. I will take down your names. Thank you all. Um, so, David, I was wanted to to say something regarding the uh, the school vaccination clinic. I know that, um, especially we have a broader audience here. If anybody has any connections, I know that some schools have done vaccination clinics that weren't through the state. They were like partnered with a private pharmacy or a private clinic. Um, so if anybody has a connection like that, email, email David. Like I know that a uh, school, one of my coworkers, uh, St. Paul Drug, which is just a private independent pharmacy in St. Paul, is the one who organized their vaccination clinic. So if anybody's got connections and if we want to make that happen at school, um, that might be a quicker way to get to a clinic than waiting on the state. Absolutely. I'm totally open to that. You should introduce yourself, Casey, since you were talking. <laughs> oh, sorry, Casey. Yeah. Um, uh, Casey's a member of the committee, definitely. Um, and thank you for that, because I would um, I would love to build that kind of a connection with someone. Yeah. Um, I see from uh, a member who uh, a member of the community who's here tonight um, is asking, how do we join the committee? Um, really, all you have to do is email me, although we have been talking about having more of these types of public sessions. So I don't think that um, it will be long before we have another one of these uh, sort of question and answer kind of public sessions. Um, but also all you have to do to get a, a, to become an actual, you know, member of the committee um, on a, you know, two or three week basis um, is send me an email and, and request it of me. So D Nunez, D-N-U-N-E-Z at greatriverschools.org. Um, there was a student organized vaccination clinic at Great River School last June, I believe. It was their CAM project from last year. Oh, does anyone know who those students were? Perhaps they still have those connections and could organize another clinic. I was not aware of that at all. That's super fascinating. So. Um, does anyone know anything about that? Student organized vaccination clinic? I'm going to ask about it at the leadership meeting tomorrow. It might be a good question for Tammy because it would have been someone in either seventh and eighth or eighth grade last year. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I will ask Tammy tomorrow about that because I had not heard a thing about that before. All right. 
Well, it is seven o'clock. Um, anybody who wants to stay on and ask me any, any other questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, but um, we are coming to the end of tonight's session. So if you want to sign off, you're also more than welcome to do that. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time and, um, and all the support that the families and community members of Great River have been giving the school this year. It's been truly phenomenal. So 